us. This is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show making our way home on this uh, Friday edition of the program. And, of course, uh, the end of the week, we uh, take a look at uh, all of the issues of the uh, past week. And uh, we should have a segment just on that, right? Shouldn't we do that? All right. We'll figure out that for next month. Um, Our next guest comes to us from the great 206. So we went from New York City. Uh, where Harvey K is today, uh, and we go uh, up 95, then out to uh, via Boston 90, and take it all the way through Chicago and uh, the Rocky Mountain West, and we go to the 206 in Seattle, WA, and we find our good friend, uh, Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield. DeMarks, you watch news, the Jeff Santos Show, and, of course, the best local music in Seattle. MTC is here. Eat your heart out, Jimmy. I got Jimmy right here. Actually, uh, I have a framed picture of him with a gold-plated 45 of his single, or Hey Joe, right here by Jimmy. And Jimmy actually has been one of my major influences. In fact, I told the story before about how I had a dream where he taught me some guitar that's no lie on the streets of Seattle. Um, but, uh, yeah, he was a big fan of Dylan, actually, so that's an interesting story in itself. Yeah, uh, no, no doubt, no doubt. You know that 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 time period, boy, sixties, seventies would would love to have been an adult uh, and uh, or a teenager uh, to to experience that. So much to talk about with you, Mark. Uh, you got a city attorney race going on there. A lot of trash talk uh, from the more Republican uh, running for city attorney. You got uh, lots going on with virtual reality and everything else. But I want to start off. We've been talking about it, and you know, and it, frankly, it's been a lot of negative news because we go from six trillion in the budget reconciliation plan, as I call it, the Roosevelt plan, and then you go to three point five, which was the compromise. Now we're at one point seven, but thank God for Miss Jayapal, who you have told us about four, five, six years ago when she first ran, I believe, in two thousand sixteen, and she's now the head of the Progressive Caucus and doing a fantastic job and standing tall against basically giving away the store to more and more corporate Democrats and, and saying, come on, Nancy Pelosi, embarrassing if we, we don't pass this, this infrastructure giveaway to private companies and hedge fund companies? Uh, you said it. She is a, a true jewel, and uh, don't ever lose her. Yeah, well, you know, she had a town hall meeting just the other night that she invited me to, and it, once again, she is always uh, rallying the troops the battle cry for the progressive causes and she's right there with bernie sanders right now on this idea of extending medicare to cover medical or cover dental and hearing aids and things like that which is just you know stupid that it doesn't um if you really want to end poverty especially for uh people who are elderly but it's i mean it's been a crazy week i heard some of your guests talk about that earlier today because yeah we had the facebook now called meta connect 2021 conference on augmented and virtual reality i got interviewed by a Chicago TV station a couple times. There's a video podcast podcast production sessions going on for Democracy Watch News now because now I'm proud to uh, announce as executive director for Democracy Watch News that we have a weekly video podcast now where you'll... Awesome. Uh, featuring your intrepid reporter, MTC, and also um, uh, some other great journalists from across the country uh, about a, a really good report on this next uh, podcast about the Connect 2021 conference and its potential for journalism. But, yeah, I'm also I've got a major recording studio project, of course, while we're building the studio, and I've got band rehearsal and guest appearances on Tom Hartman's show earlier today and stuff, so it's been a crazy time. But um, Pernilla is somebody that I really appreciate. I, I've been trying to follow her through, the, through all of this, and what I keep finding is that... Um, She's always at least sounding the right message, and that is something that she's very consistent about. And I think, you know, she has that in common with Bernie Sanders in some ways, although Bernie has moved on certain issues, including Palestine, but 
but he he's been more consistent than almost any politician I know throughout my lifetime. You know, of knowing him since he was, uh, or knowing about him since he was the mayor of Burlington, Vermont. You know, which surprised to him, he didn't even think he was going to get elected. But ever since then, he has been definitely sounding the battle cry for progressive causes, and she's right there with him. And you know, I know there's this sort of tight relationship between these progressive Northwest uh, politicians and political political representatives, especially Pramila Jayapal. Um, but Sanders has also endorsed Lorena Gonzalez, who's running for mayor. And, you know, we have the election coming up on Tuesday, so that's a really intense race. So the city attorney here, race, yeah. Oh, that's another, that's a whole other um, series of issues we could talk about, Jeff. Definitely there's a battle on there going on. Normally in Seattle, it's the neoliberals versus the progressives. In this case, it's uh, a Republican. And actually, she is a Republican. Her name is Ann Davison. And she actually was a Democrat, um, but flipped just within the last year while Trump was president, actually, which is just mind blowing. Um, but she had run for city council before as a Democrat. And so we've got her, we've got um, Nikita Oliver, who's very much left of center with the People's Party running for his city council. And Bernie Sanders keeps a pretty close eye on what's happening up here. And when he's in the Northwest, you can see just by watching him the relationship that he has with uh, political representatives like Pramila Jayapal, like Shama Sawant, our uh, member of the uh, Socialist Alternative Party who's um, on the city council here. He has a very tight relationship with them. And you can tell when, when he's here and when they're together that they're very they're close. So he has been involved in city politics here because I think he sees Washington State and Seattle especially as a, a sort of bellwether a region for the rest of the country, as you've you know pointed out many times before, the $15 an hour minimum wage, you know, marriage equality, legalization of cannabis, a lot of those issues have spread across the country. And when it comes to the city um, uh, attorney's race, uh, we have a very strange thing happening here that uh, caught me by surprise. So Pete uh, Holmes has been our city attorney for a long time. So he, he was on his third term there. And a uh, very popular guy for the most part, except with the police department and more conservative law and order types, because he dropped almost all of the convictions on cannabis uh, possession. He uh, pretty much tried to do away with a lot of uh, misdemeanor um, infractions and tried to do alternative sentencing and things like that. So very reformist kind of guy, especially when he first came into office. And as I've told this story many times before, he was the first person in line. Him, with he and Marlon Chase. Our, state, our legislative representative from this district were the first few people in line at the first legal pot shop in Seattle, and he was so proud of showing off his pot to me, you know, that he had bought legally. Um, so he was very much for uh, legalization of cannabis and got a trophy from Hemp Fest, you know, that huge festival in Seattle that celebrates cannabis. You know, he was very proud of that. He spoke at that event where I've also spoken. So, you know, I carried his business card around in my wallet for a long time because he told me, if you get arrested as a journalist, you know, during a protest, just call me and we'll make sure the charges get dropped and you get released or whatever. Because, you know, he knew that the police were doing things like that. The cops, of course, don't like him. The police guild, I should say, doesn't like him. The Seattle Police Officers Guild. So they ran someone against him. Her name is Ann Davison. And she's supported by a lot of local business interests. And surprisingly, even, you know, Vulcan Incorporated, which is the real estate and construction empire basically that paul allen left behind when he passed away a year and a half ago or so um he was a co-founder of microsoft with bill gates so local billionaire and along with building the museum of pop culture and the paul allen brain institute he also used vulcan as a way of changing the entire neighborhood before amazon moved in so between the vulcan and amazon the entire downtown section in south lake union area of seattle was totally redeveloped by these corporations well they have um funded a group called you know seattle for common sense or some ridiculous thing they always choose you know some innocuous name but they are a group of conservative business interests and wealthy folks who do not like uh, pete holmes so they were able to actually um get their candidate through the primary and pete actually lost in a three-way race to somebody even more uh liberal than he is um and that's um nicole thomas kennedy uh, so she made it through the primary, and Pete didn't, to everyone's surprise, including mine. You know, he got 30-some percent of the vote, but not enough to get through the primary. So uh, he was embarrassed, you know, and but that's what happens in politics sometimes, right? It was a surprise finish. So now we have a candidate who's being smeared 
by these uh, conservative business interests, and that's Nicole Thomas Kennedy. Uh, she's a public defender who was, you know, outraged by what she saw as police brutality uh, perpetrated against Black Lives Matter protesters last year when the police were using massive amounts of tear gas on the protesters. And she was really worried about her nine-year-old daughter and having to buy a gas mask and all that. So she tweeted out some pretty uh, vociferous uh, um, comments about the police department, for sure, during that time. Well, they've been used against her now. So now you have this conservative group of business interests that are sending out flyers, which I and I received one, claiming that uh, she cheers violence against police officers. She endorses rioting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me stop you there because I, I I saw that when you sent it to me, and I'm like, here we go. This is right out of you know Republican playbook. Of course, she is a Republican, and Seattle's overwhelmingly Democratic and more progressive. So one thing to be Democratic, actually, but it's a progressive Jeff, uh, city. Jeff, she is actually now a Republican. She ran as a Democrat for city council last year, lost then became a Republican. So she is a member of the GOP. So she, she, she actually went the other way. Oh, my God. Yes. Not yes. exactly smart. But, you know, in this case, they, they, and again, I know there's some evidence of um, of some statements that Miss um, Kennedy had made, but, you know, I mean, it, it's gutter politics, and this is sort of what Republicans do. Has has she, um, uh, Miss Kennedy, come out and say, look, you know, there are some things that, that I said that I wish I didn't, uh, but look, this is what I want to do. You know, I'm not throwing away, uh, we're not going to defund the police, we're not going to do X, Y, and Z. How, has she been able to sort of bounce off of these ridiculous ads? And is it, is it now a close race? Or, you know, is the amount of money that Miss Davison has, has really, um, you know, put uh, Miss Kennedy in a, in a real problem uh, you know, four or five days away from the election. I'd say you just put your finger on it, Jeff, because a lot of money's been spent to smear uh, Nicole Thomas Kennedy, and it's the same scenario that's been used many times before. Right wingers, oftentimes across the country, like to point at Seattle and blame it for everything wrong with the country, and always blame liberal and progressive politics for it, and call everybody here anarchists. So they're claiming basically that. Uh, she is dangerous and that the city will be in chaos if she's elected. And they're already saying, you know, Trump was saying that Seattle has been in chaos for how long now? Two years or something? You know, I'm not seeing it. You know, there's no, there's no writing going on on the streets here. But they, the right wing would like you to believe that because Seattle and Portland, especially San Francisco, to some extent, are scapegoats for the conservative side of things. So it's negative propaganda it's what is used you know in times of war to spread rumors about the enemy so they're doing that in this campaign and it's so sad to see that uh, she has not been able to bounce back in the polls in fact uh, leading up to the election uh, her opponent is gaining but there is a large undecided uh, portion of the vote according to these um, polls so it could change at the last minute i don't know but the trend right now unfortunately is that support is going towards the Republican candidate, because they they have convinced enough of the voters that the Democrat is some crazy, dangerous radical, and it's really sad, Jeff, that it's gotten this mean and dirty in Seattle. And it's it, but it gives you an indication of what the Republicans would like to do. One, you have a Trojan horse. You have somebody who is a Democrat and works within the Democratic Party, but then switches at the last minute. That's one of their tactics. The other thing is that you have you have somebody in a position where they can at least deal with prosecutions. She actually is not going to be in charge of the police department. So whatever reforms happen in the police department are going to have to be between the mayor and the city council and the police. The city attorney does have some say so over things like whether they continue to follow the consent decree, which is a result of a Department of Justice investigation into the Seattle Police Department for racial profiling and excessive use of force. So there is an agreement amongst uh, the parties involved in that um, that the city of Seattle will follow certain ref, you know, rules and reforms. Well, we'll see, because if you have a city attorney that's willing to prosecute every you know protester that gets arrested and is very much in support of the police department, she can't decide who gets to be the police chief, but she can kind of uh, give officers a, a cover who may feel like they, they have less accountability now because they have somebody on their side in the city attorney's office, which is what they wanted. The police guild really did not like Pete Holmes at all. They wanted him gone. Um, they claimed that, you know, he wasn't prosecuting enough uh, of the people they were referring you to. you got to get those convictions. That's how we can put people in jail. We make money that way. 
I, I, and I know it, it's it's not as bad in, in a place like Seattle, but that's what has, is around the country. I mean, just think of what happened in Ferguson. You know, all those parking tickets they gave out, people couldn't pay them. That gives uh, it gives resource to arrest people because they didn't pay their, their things. And before you know it, they're serving time in jail. Then they go and they end up with a misdemeanor. Then they spend another 10 years in jail. It just all adds up. They love that stuff, uh, the right wing. And, and, and it usually happens against people of color. Uh Tragic, tragic, tragic. Well, I hope she can win. I want to go to our good friend John uh, in Minneapolis, and, and then I want to talk to you about Facebook changing their name. <laughs> I just saw an ad, and they're bringing out all these white people, you know, and, and, and then a couple of people of color. And, you know, we're all smiling, you know, and it says paid for by Facebook at the bottom of the uh, of the screen. You know, it's, it's, it's pathetic, but that's where we are. Uh, all right, let's go to John in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, you are uh, next with... Uh, Mark Taylor Canfield. Uh, go right ahead, John. Yes, uh, we have a, a ballot initiative here that uh, I think it probably is going to pass that will reorganize the police department and has gotten support by our state attorney general and um, my congressman, Ilhan Omar, against uh, you know the objections of the mayor who would rather serve the police union. And this has been a perennial problem. And apparently uh, they actually wrote themselves into the city charter in 1960 uh, that... Uh, the police would be tied how many police are hired is tied to population regardless of whether they're actually needed so we were really very very uh heavy in police we had more per capita than new york city and uh our mayor sharon sales belden she may one of been maybe one of the first uh black mayors in uh the country uh, you know, was uh, very much uh, interested in reorganizing the police, and she was primaried out uh, by the uh, the DFL, the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, and uh, R.T. Rybeck uh, was put in as uh, mayor, and you never heard from her ever again, even though she served two terms. So the police really, I, I think, throughout this country, they really... Uh, are a force to be reckoned with and a force that's anti-democratic. Uh, I don't know what else I could, I could say. Look at what happened in New York City where uh, a person was on the subway and asked the two policemen that were also on the same in the same car to put a mask on. They were pulled out, and this was all caught on film, pulled out of the subway car and thrown out, you know, before uh, their stop. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, no, I mean it's it's without... awful. I saw that same video. It, it, it's yeah. just it's just outrageous. And, yep. and I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering, John and um, mm -hmm. and, and Mark, uh, are we at a, at a point right now where the you know these what has happened on camera phones? Of course, that was the the big thing that happened in in, in Minneapolis uh, by that young uh, African American teenager. Uh, what we're seeing, I mean, a lot of the video that we now see in, in all these incidents are, are all uh, family, friends, uh, um, you know, innocent bystanders, uh, observers with their camera phones taking this information. And, and, it, and of course, it, it, it got led to the conviction of Chauvin in Minneapolis. I'm just wondering if, if we're now at a point with the momentum, as hopefully uh, uh, John in, in Minneapolis is saying, that, that these things are going to happen, that maybe that bows well for somebody like a true reformer and again a public defender thomas kennedy that to me would be uh that would be a good sign well we can only hope uh the, the trend in seattle has always been that it's ironic that we have such a progressive city although i'd say you know keep a close eye on minneapolis because they're, they're sort of setting the standard right now for uh, for police reform but um in the trend in Seattle has always been a recalcitrant police force um, with usually a friend in the mayor's office uh, who may call themselves a liberal but tend to kind of uh, crack down and go law and order when it comes to protests. Then you have um, a business community that supports that point of view. It's also supported by at least one major corporate uh, news broadcasting corporation in seattle owned by sinclair broadcasting so they they have made their bones about their political point of view um and it's always pro-police and anti-protester and you know it kind of runs the gamut to you know 
to the, the Glenn Becks and Rush Limbaugh's of the world and stuff like that. So it gets kind of crazy. It's usually a small um, minority of the population, but when you own media and you have a lot of money and can uh, influence elections, you know, they're definitely going to try. And so that voice has always been represented in Seattle, and it it seems like it's part of Seattle's almost like polite nature that, yes, of course, we'll let conservatives speak, and, you know, they'll have their their day in the sun but actually a lot of times it's just pure propaganda and uh it's not being challenged by the corporate media in the way it should and i i you know so i'm worried that um with a city attorney like that and and if bruce harrell wins as our mayor even though he's a uh, african-american man and you know has all sorts of experiences that you know white folks would never understand he still is being backed by a lot of conservative business interests who feel like um, things like increasing corporate taxes is a bad idea. They think that cutting the police budget is a bad idea. You know, we're not even talking about even close to abolishing anything in, in Seattle. And Seattle had some of the most active and most uh, confrontational protests in the country. That You know, the amount of uh, so-called, or I call less lethal weaponry that the police were using, the rubber bullets and things that I was subjected to and other people, the tear gas, the amount of that was like a it was like small a small scale war going on here, and yet now we're back to the old same as same as neoliberal, um, mostly white male dominated culture. We do have female uh, representatives on the city council in the mayor's office and in Congress, but there are still a lot of the old boy network left over that ha- has backing from corporate folks, and they are not so progressive, and they have business interests, um, and they think they have to lose when you do things like raise the minimum wage but but yeah we should but we should talk about tech too right because that's yeah no i mean i I just think that of course seattle is a big part of it and of course uh i know that uh john uses facebook we all do uh i I use twitter more thankfully actually but um i think it's the better platform uh but you know it it, to me it's you know i think rachel maddow i'll I'll give her credit and i I had thought about this before actually remember a value jet in the 1990s uh, tragically uh killed a whole slew of people and they changed the name to antran which still exists and you know they thought we could fool some people hey you know we're no longer value jet and it's it's just now face uh, facebook be calling meta um you know i mean I, i just look at this it's just another another propaganda pr stunt um you know they are who they are. It's it's that simple, uh, Mark. Well, I have several impressions having uh, participated in their Connect twenty twenty one conference as a journalist. First of all, uh, so the critic, the, my criticisms. You know, it was all pre packaged, pre produced. None of it was really live. Uh, it was just a corporate presentation. So you could tell that people were acting parts and you know reading lines. But they had something they wanted to promote, especially during. Mark Zuckerman's keynote address, and it's this idea that uh, they are going to step away from Facebook as a parent company. Uh, they're going to keep Facebook as it is, as an app, as an application, basically, as a segment of what they do. But uh, according to Zuckerman, they want to move to uh, be the major platform promoter of uh, augmented and virtual reality. So they're banking on the uh, goggles, uh, the Oculus that are um, out there that you can use right now on Facebook platforms they're called Horizon that are platforms that you can use these on and unfortunately the headsets are still the goggles are still about $300 a piece wow but uh, I appreciate it no doubt Mark because that's over a thousand so. you got it right on uh, thank you John for the call as well uh, I want to uh, Mark uh, all the best uh, check out the Marks you watch news now with a video we'll talk to you next Friday Mark Thank you, my friend. Have a great weekend. Keep rocking, Jeff. Take care. Have a good weekend. See you all later. You too. I want to thank Ron Carter for producing this broadcast. Thank you for listening, folks. Thank you for calling. Your best listeners, best callers. Have yourself a great weekend. Keep on fighting peacefully. My name is Jeff Santos, and right now it is my time to say I got to go. The Jeff Santos Show is heard every weekday on this station between 3 and 6 p.m. To listen to podcasts of The Jeff Santos Show, go to revolutionradionetwork.com. With SRN News, I'm Keith Peters in Washington. Moderate Democrats Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are leaving their mark on the party. Bob Agnew reports. In the tug-of-war between leftists and moderates, Sinema and Manchin have managed not only to hold the line, but to move the president in their direction. 
what began as a $3.5 trillion proposal. The Build Back Better package has shrunk to roughly half its original size. It still gains no Republican support, but is much closer to securing approval from Manchin and Cinema. both now getting mixed reviews from Democrat colleagues. Majority Whip Dick Durbin describes it, too, as very influential and hammering out the compromise, and he adds for better or worse. Bob Agner reporting. Iowa's Republican governor has signed into law a bill that allows workers in the state to seek medical and religious exemptions from COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Correspondent Ben Thomas reports. Governor Kim Reynolds says no Iowan should lose their job over the vaccine. The new law also guarantees those who are fired for refusing a shot will qualify for unemployment benefits. While Reynolds has said the vaccine is the best defense against COVID-19, she says she plans to sue the federal government to challenge its proposed vaccine mandates once the Biden administration releases the rules. 55.4% of Iowa's population is fully vaccinated. That ranks 23rd among states, according to the CDC. I'm Ben Thomas. The fatal shooting by Alec Baldwin on a movie set has put a microscope on an often unseen corner of the film industry where critics say the pursuit of profit can lead to unsafe working conditions. With a budget of around $7 million, the Western Rust was no micro-budget indie. The previous Best Picture winner at the Academy Awards, Nomadland, was made for less But the New Mexico set where Baldwin shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins had inexperienced crew members, apparent safety lapses, and a serious labor dispute. This is SRN News.